a perspective, a sociological perspective, gives a theoretical explanation of society's existence. A sociological perspective gives a theoretical, let me go again, that is very important, explanation of society's existence. Now, remember, sociology is the study of society and why it exists. And so we have been looking at the various perspectives. We looked at functionalism. Hold a moment. Yes. So we looked at the four major perspectives. We looked at functionalist perspective. Who is a big functionalist? Always ask yourself that. Once it is that you get to your reading, you're studying a new class, always try to recap. So who's the big functionalist? Emil Durkheim. What they compare society to? The human body. Try to remember that, right? How do they explain society's existence? They say that society has institutions that are functional. Good. We also looked at the conflict, yeah? And I made it clear to you that the conflict perspective is a huge perspective. But the conflict theory that is most important is Marxism. And who's the big Marxist? Karl Marx. Good. And of course, they explain society's existence by looking at the two groups that exist. The small rich group called the bourgeois in the capitalist society and the large poor groups called the proletariats. Yeah? And how the capitalist system is the basis of the exploitation and conflict. We looked at all of that. Yeah. And so you should remember the key terms. When you get into exams, you should know key terms. For instance, you should know value consensus. And once you hear consensus any at all, you should know it's the functionalist. You should know false class consciousness. And once you hear the term false class consciousness, you should know that it is the Marxist. Yeah? So you want to remember that when it is that you're reading, when it is that you enter a class, when it is that you're studying, it is not just about the knowledge. And the knowledge is very, very important. But you're also preparing for the exam. Yeah? I always remind students, you believe you start preparing when it's two weeks before when you start SWAT. Mash down that lie, yeah? So start remembering, drawing on your key terms, write them down, use them in sentences, talk to your friend. Yeah, you hear your friend say something, you say, you know what? That is the false class consciousness. Big up your chest, you feel bright, yeah? That sort of thing. Today now, we're going to look at the final two. Many persons argue that they're the two smaller of the four, but not necessarily so. We're going to look at interactionism and we're going to look at feminism. So let's go. We're going to start with the interactionist view. Now I tell you already, interactionism would be the noun. The interactionist perspective is what we would be talking about, right? So it's the same thing. So we'll talk about the interactionist perspective. Now we're using interactionist as an adjective. Or the people are the interactionist. Good? Now, imperative. Big, big point. The interactionist perspective is a micro-perspective. The interactionist perspective is a micro perspective, whereas the functionalist and the Marxist perspectives are macro, right? So the functionalist and the Marxist are macro, whereas the interactionist are micro. What does that mean? Come again, because this will come from multiple choice exam, yeah? What does that mean? The micro, let's go. The micro versus the macro. Macro sociologists in general look at society on the whole. So when it was that we looked at the functionalist and the Marxist, the functionalist would speak to us about how the institutions impact the individuals in society. Their analysis is a holistic analysis, so they look at society on the whole. Whereas the micro look at individual and small group interactions. So the functionalists and the Marxists are macro, whereas the interactionists are micro. It means that the interactionists, when it is that they're going to explain society, instead of looking at the general society, they start looking at the individuals. They small start looking at small group interaction. So they don't just look at the family in general, they're looking at the individuals in the family. Whereas the functionalists and the Marxists, they would be looking at the family in general, or religion in general, or the entire society. No, that is imperative enough. Because when it is that we start now doing our essays, and we start having what they call use of knowledge, and you start having analysis, you should be able to compare and contrast the different perspectives, the different views. Good? So remember, macro, micro, write it down. Write it down. The functionalists and the Marxists are macro, but the interactionists are micro. It means, therefore, 
that the interactionists, as macro people, they look at how individuals impact the society. Whereas the functionalists and the Marxists as macro look at how the society impacts the individuals. Let's go again. The interactionists, as micro people, they look at how the individual impacts the society. Whereas the functionalists and the Marxists, they look at how the society impacts the individuals. And you know that because when we looked at functionalism and Marxism, we were looking at how the structure of the society or the institutions in the society impact your behavior. Now when you go to the interactionists, they're going to be look at how, looking at sorry, how you impact the society. So let's get into the meat of the matter. Here I go. Major interactionists, I make it clear to you, you cannot do sociology without knowing the names. So you must know, just like how you had to know Emile Durkheim from functionalism and you had to know Karl Marx from the conflict, you must know the major interactionists. And they are Charles Cooley, George Herbert Mead. Charles Cooley, George Herbert Mead. Now, as we get into your syllabus, we're going to have quite a few discussions about these men. Just like how you got your Durkheim name, regular, regular. Because remember, Durkheim is also said to be the father of sociology. Yeah? Wonderful. So, the interaction is Charles Cooley, George Herbert Mead. Now, let's get into what the interactionists believe. The interactionists argue that if one is to understand society, and remember, once it is that you're studying sociology, you are trying to understand society. The interactionists argue that to understand society, you must first understand human behavior. Because it is people's behavior that determine the society that you live in. So to understand the existence of the Jamaican society, you must first understand why Jamaican people behave in the manner that they behave. Because it is the accumulation of our behaviors that will determine the society that we live in. So first, before I try to understand the big thing which is the society, let me first try to understand why the people that impact the society behave in the way they do. Good? big thing, which of course speaks to the fact that they are micro. And so instead of looking at how society impacts the individual, they're looking at how the individual impact the society. Coming with me? You're with me? Because if you lose me at the perspectives, you know, you're going to have a problem moving forward. If you have a basic understanding of the perspectives, my job is done, you're going to go in and you're going to mash up the exam. But if you lose it, if you don't understand the difference between micro and macro, if you don't understand where the interactionists are coming from, then automatically when you get to big topics, you start having issues. Yeah? So I keep saying, ensure you get the basics first. So let's get into the interactions a little bit more. So when we talk about the interactionists now, yeah? They say to understand society, you must first understand why people behave in the manner that they do. And so they have said, based on our research, we have found that there are two things that determine how you behave. One is your self-concept, and the second is your interpretation of the situation. So what determines how humans will interact and what you will do? One is your self-concept, and the second is your interpretation of the situation. Now let's start with self-concept. In layman's term, when you just talk to your friend, when you hear about self-concept, you simply think it is your view of yourself, yeah? It's who you believe yourself to be. But when you get into the sociological sense of the term self-concept, the self-concept really is your view of others' view of you. According to the interactionist, the self-concept is your view of others' view of you. It means that your self-concept is not just your view of yourself. That's not true. And when it comes to multiple choice, then I'm going to ask you, what is self-concept? And A is going to be your view of yourself. That is wrong. That is wrong. And the phone is not even going to read B, C, and D. You know. not going to just stick A on the move on the feel bright. And you come out here and say, I'm going to mash up the exam. That is wrong. Your self-concept, according to the sociologist, the interactionist, is not your view of yourself. Instead, your self-concept is your view of others' view of you. Is what you think other people think about you. That's what your self-concept is. So it is the me that I see when I look into your eyes. 
So I might believe initially that I am A. But when I see everybody start saying me a B, then automatically my view change. It's like if you believe you're a hot girl. You know, when a girl feels hot, she walk different, you know. When a girl feels hot in a party, she kind of strut. She flip her ear all three times. Make your ear all just do. Different kind of thing. And you feel your hot, you know. That's the understanding. But make you walk around two times in a party. And then your friends say, my girl, you never know so I dress a party or what that you're in. Then all of a sudden, you start wondering if you're really hot. Yeah, you start, uh, you know, you start step back a little bit. Yeah, and that's because the self-concept is not just your view. It is your view of others' view of you. It means as well that your self-concept is not others' view. This is where people get a little confused. Your self-concept is not what the other people them think. It's what you think the other people them think. So if a guy believe a girl like him, whether or not she like him is not important. It is the fact that him think says she like him. So the first time him try, I said, baby, you know, how are you? May I have your number, please? And he said, no, you can't have a number. Him don't think says she like him already. So him said to him, Bridget, said, no, no. I play, she play hard to get. Just wait the man. Wait the man. Me so sorry to talk. You know, that sort of thing. Because whether or not she like him is not important. It is the fact that him think so. That is important. Your self-concept is not your view of yourself, is not others' view of you. It is your view of others' view of you. It is what you think other people think about you. And your self-concept will determine how you behave. And if your self-concept changes, then guess what? Your behavior will change as well. It means, therefore, that you and I can be in the exact same situation. But because our self-concepts differ, you find that our behaviors will differ as well. It means that the interaction that we might find in one place in Jamaica might be different from the interaction in another place because the people themselves concept differ. And once again, we move to a very big difference between the functionalists and the Marxists who are macro and the interactionists who are micro. Because the functionalists and the Marxists take it for granted that if you and I are from the same society, socialized by the same institutions, and we find ourselves in the same situation, then we will behave in the same way because we learn the same things as right and the same things as wrong. But the interaction is said that are rubbish. You and I can be in the exact same situation, but because our self-concepts differ, our behaviors will differ. And so the society keep a change because a whole lot of different people, different interactions with different self-concepts. Are you getting what I'm saying? Which is why they're seeing as micro, them start look at you, the individual, and how your behaviors continuously contribute to the society you live in. Are you with me? So, big term again, self-concept. Your self-concept is one determinant of your behavior. Yeah? And of course, we're trying to understand why you behave the way you behave because we're interactionists. That's who we're looking at. And the interactionist says, if you want to understand society, you must first understand the people and how they behave because it is people's behavior that shape society. Now let's go to a key thing again, key term. Charles Cooley. Charles Cooley calls the self-concept the looking glass self, key term, most compound exam. Either in a multiple choice or in your essays, the looking glass self is going to figure somewhere. The looking glass self is just what I explained before. It is your view of others' view of you. That's how Charles Cooley defines the term self-concept. But you want to know the jargon. And when you write your essay, you want instead of just saying self-concept and move on, you say self-concept and you put dash, the looking glass self. And then the examiner look for you and I say, look for the one you're in bright. Hey, tiki. That's the sort of thing that we're expecting. Yeah? So you must know the jargon, the looking glass self. Right? Given to us by Charles Cooley. And the looking glass self is really an explanation of the self-concept. Yeah? And it helps to determine your behavior. Good. Another thing that determines your behavior is your interpretation of the situation. Is what you believe is happening right now. Now, it is important to note that you and I can be in the same situation. 
we are seeing the exact same thing, but our interpretation is different. And so our behavior is different. You see a bear, you see danger, so you run. That are your interpretation of the situation. I might be a zookeeper, I see a bear, and I'm like, look at that, a bear, you know, that sort of thing. And so because my interpretation is different, then my behavior is different, yeah? So you find, for instance, I remember once I was on campus and I saw a group of boys. And when I said them are beat up on next boy, them gang him and them are beat him and them are kick him. And I am running over. I'm running over as a mother. I'm running over as an educator. I'm running over just as a concerned human. And I'm like, well, not no. You know, I'm never put on all my teacher voice now. Now I come on and them no say, this never can work. You know? And I see like the security, he's standing and he's watching the other guys then beat him up. That time me in, but me I think about oh, me can't reach from Alaska, me I'll probably trap one of them for make it stop because it can't work. When I get there, they must say, Miss no, Miss I'm birthday. Me I say, what? All the youth when they depend on the ground, him get up and brush up, yo, yeah, Miss Ami Birthday. I mean, I say, what? You know, see them and murder you. But now, the others who had a different interpretation, they were like all fun and joke. Is in birthday, just give him a few kick, you know, box him two times, that sort of thing, happy birthday. I saw it, and my interpretation is like, look at these guys trying to murder the other young man. And so my behavior, my reaction would have been different because of my interpretation of the situation. The interaction, it says, another key thing that determines your behavior is your interpretation of the situation. Consequently, the sort of society that I will create based on my interpretation might be different from the society that you as a younger group would create based on full interpretation of wrong, right, good, bad. Yeah? The interaction is said to understand the society. You must first understand the behavior of people and why people behave in the manner that they behave. And the two key things that determine how you behave is one, your self-concept, and two is your interpretation of the situation. Consequently, the interactionist, unlike the functionalist and the Marxist, believes that society will continuously change because people's interactions and their behavior change. The functionalist and the Marxist are like, no, no. The institution tell you if you do, and you do it, all on going to behave the same way all the time. Marx said to continue till you have revolution. That's the only way we can get no change. Yeah? The functionalist and the Marxist are like, no, no. The institutions are going to always tell you society is going to remain constant. So let me tell you what just happened to you now. Not only do you now understand the functionalists, the Marxists, and the interactionists, but you should be able, if a question is posed, you should be able to compare and contrast. Because now you also know the difference between macro and micro, and you also know who are the ones that are macro and who are the ones that are micro, and consequently, how they see society. As a matter of fact, if you dig deep, you can start all talk about societal change. If you want to start all move right, if you think hard about it, you can speak about how the functionalists and the Marxists see change versus the interactionists. All of that is coming from just the basic understanding of what the perspectives see. And so I say to you once more, that just having an understanding of the perspectives is 50% of the battle. If you have the proper understanding, you can get to the point where you pass the exam. Are you following? Now, I also said to you that every single solitary perspective is criticized. There is never a perspective that everybody thinks, say, yeah, man, this good and this right. And so the interactionist perspective, this micro perspective, Charles Cooley and George Herbert Mead's perspective is criticized. The critics of the interactionist perspective the major criticism of the, oh, well, this is a big point that we made. Interactions believe society is believe, determined by the people and their behavior. So let's go to the criticism. The major criticism of interactionism is that they are too micro, meaning that they ignore, the interactionists ignore the impact of the agents of socialization. The interactionists take it for granted that just you alone as an individual will determine how you behave. It's either your self-concept or it is your interpretation of the situation. They take it for granted that the family that you come from not really impact you or your self-concept or your interpretation. 
But the fact of the matter is that your self-concept is also determined by the family where you come from. Your interpretation of the situation is also determined by the family that you come from, by the school that you go, by the church that you go. The interactionists don't look at that. Don't, they don't see that the agents of socialization and society itself impacts who you are as an individual and how you will behave. For instance, my entire family load. My entire family load, load. Yeah, my brother, my sister, all the way, loud. Because my father was a loud man, and my mother never too shy neither, that sort of thing. So when we are talking, people are asked why we are short. I mean, so we're not short, we're not mal vice. Like, we are, we are dealing with, yeah? Because, yeah, or who we are and how we behave is also impacted by the family that we go in. The school where you go. You have people that you know with school. You know KC guys. Hmm? Both the KC guy, whether them know or know not. When I'm in a university lecture, I know the young man that is from KC. When him get up to talk, him talk with a whole lot of confidence. I want it wrong. The functionalist Karl Marx says, I'm saying, no, Karl Marx, says, no, Miss, but I don't know, man. Miss, but I tell you, I soon get to the point. Do you understand? Miss, me for artist, man. I'm like, what that mean? Yeah? But the institution that him come from, impact how you behave. The religion that you subscribe to impact how you behave. But the interactionists don't see that. They take it for granted that it's just your self-concept alone. Not seeing that your family helped to determine your self-concept or your interpretation of the society. Not seeing that the society that you're living helped to determine your interpretation. If you come from Jamaica and you see people are run, you know so you have to run too. Just because you're Jamaican, even if you want to know what you are, you are hey, what you are, tell me. But you are wrong because you're Jamaican. And because of your Jamaican experience, you have a particular interpretation. If you come from another country, you might say people are wrong and you're like, oh, wait, it's marathon season. I did not know. You know, I just stand up. If you ever that told us that people are wrong, you not ever think of marathon season. You have to go find out about the marathon when you reach your yard because you are Jamaican. So the interactionists are criticized as being too micro. They do not look at the impact of the society, the agents of, the social, of socialization on the individuals. And so their theory is seen as flawed. It is too micro. Are you with me? Wonderful. So we have been looking at the perspectives each have been giving their own explanation of society's existence. We have looked at functionalism and Emil Durkheim, who's the father of sociology. We have looked at the conflict perspective. In particular, we have looked at Karl Marx, yeah, and Marxism. We have looked at the interactionists who are micro, whereas the functionalists and the Marxists have been macro. So we look at Charles Cooley and we look at George Herbert Mead. Yeah, they are the interactionists, and as we go along, We'll hear more from them. Now let's look at the final perspective for us. Because I say for us, you know, because when you go to advanced level again, you go degree and then master's and PhD, you learn more holy for others. But for your syllabus, which is the grade 12 syllabus, I keep hearing grade 13, but this is actually grade 12. The grade 12 syllabus, then the final one we're looking at as a major perspective, the feminist perspective. Feminist perspective. Now, feminism, the one thing that all feminists have in common, all feminists believe that women are being exploited. Every single solitary feminist. They take it for granted, they, from the start on the basis that there is some exploitation of women. Now, there are three major types of feminists. You have the liberal feminists, you have the Marxist feminist, and you have the radical feminist. You must know the three types of feminists. The liberal feminist, Marxist feminist, and radical feminist. However, just the fact that they are feminists make you know already, so they believe that women are being exploited. So whether you're liberal, you're Marxist, or you're radical, all feminists believe that women are being exploited. Now we're going to start with the liberal feminists. Now, the liberal feminists simply say that women are being exploited as there's no gender equality. They say, listen, man and woman have the same job, and man get more pay. 
that is a lack of equality. And that is really showing that women are being exploited. They say if you look in our society, the freedom that men have, women don't have it. Yeah? The freedom from stigma. They say a woman is judged harshly in society. A man can have enough woman. Man must have enough girl and girl in a bungle. That sort of thing. And he is revered. Them clap for a hey, big man. Big up yourself. A girl, a woman, if she have a boyfriend, she can't even have an extra friend. Not even for say, um, a next man. You know. No, no. Not even an extra friend. If that is the case, then she's judged and she is stigmatized. Yeah? They said that is showing you that there's a lack of equality. The liberal feminists talk a lot about the sexual freedom of women and how they don't have that. How it is that a man, just look at even Jamaica. Jamaican men can go, go play football, you know. And they might play football and they want team and one set just take off their shirt. And them say, all right, we are playing skins versus shirt. No problem. If a woman ever tried that pan a netball court, you could have never even play brazier versus shirt. Never. Yeah? If you see a woman and just all see a nipple, <gasps> did you see her nipple? I don't know what nipple do then. Yeah? That is how it is. And so you find that women are stigmatized. They're judged harshly. And it is showing a lack of freedom, a lack of equality. And the result is that the liberal feminists say that women are exploited. And all they're asking for is equality. They're saying if man do the work and get $5, woman must do the work and get $5 too. If it is that the man can play skins and just take and show him chest, make the woman, if the woman wants to show her chest, make she show her chest. Chest not do no nothing. Yeah? Them say that is the sort of freedom that the woman should have. If the man can have more than one spouse, more than one girlfriend, and it is not seen as a problem, make the woman run out and start scrape them up too. Yeah? That is life. Everybody must free. Gender equality. If the gender equality is not there, the result is that women are being exploited. The critics of the liberal feminists, the critics of the liberal feminists so that women don't know what they want. They say women just say they want equality, but in reality, women want special treatment. They say, listen to me. The women say they must earn the same amount as the men, but if them go out with a man, the man must pay. How is that equality? Equality say that if everybody is on the same level, then the two will go out and the two will pay. Yeah, that is equality. But you don't want that. You don't want special treatment. You go out to the man, you still expect that he will pay. To the extent I tell you, when I was younger, I remember a young man invited me out. We were both university students at the time. Them time they went on a phone or nothing, you know. So I'm going to find me yard for invite me out. And to be honest, we never really too like, like him them time there. But you know, he invited me out. I'm going to decide to go and move. He invited me to the movies. Put on my pretty clothes. I'm going to go and move him. When I intermission, I see him sit down the same way. So I kind of I try to move too crazy, so I just I sit down and I wait a little bit. For see, smile and I do a little small talk, but I see intermission outfit done and the boy and I get up. So I said to him, say, you're not going to buy no food. He turned around to me and said, no, I'm not hungry. I say, I mix, I mix, I mix, I, add, I can't, I say, I over mix. That's before the movie done, I excuse myself for go to the bathroom and I go to my yard. When he finally find me back, he said, what happened? I said, I go to my yard, I did hungry. Yeah? But the, in, the, the critics of the feminists said that I am being unfair. First of all, the tone of university student in broke and you broke her. Yeah? You, you know so in broke. He invites you out to the movies. He never invites you out for dinner. But me come with my long belly. From me reaching, me start to think about when I go back. Yeah? And I mean, never plan to buy it myself. Yeah? And they said that is the reality to show that you don't really want equality as women. What women really want is special treatment. Equality says that if him go on me, I'll buy the ticket, you should buy the food. That is equality. But no, we want special treatment. Equality says that if you have an argument and you decide to hit the young man, him should have lick your back. But no, we're like, oh, I'm a woman. Did he just hit me? Equality says that if you're going into the car, you can't open it yourself, you have an. We might open it for. But we don't want that. We want special treatment. So the critics of the liberal feminists say women only say they want equality. But in reality, what they want is special treatment. The liberal feminists say no, we want gender equality. Anything that a man can do, the woman should be doing it as well.
right? Now, of course, I'm not a feminist. I'm not at all. Up to this moment, my bakes never buy no popcorn. My bakes right now. Yeah, so, but the feminists say that. Now, the other feminists are the Marxist feminists. Now, the Marxist feminists, you know Marxism already. So it is a mixture of feminism and Marxism. The Marxist feminists say that women are being exploited by the unfair capitalist system. They say if you look at the structure of our society, the ones who do the majority of the work really are males in the actual capitalist society. The man who do the heavy lifting are the males, even to this day. So the man goes out and he works hard. But when he works hard in the capitalist society, the capitalist society is alienating. It means that when he work hard, he gets a little bit of pay and he feels exploited. So when the man leaves from work, he is angry. But that is good. That is good because his anger is supposed to lead to the revolution that the Marxists talk about. So the system can change and everybody can get to a point where they're equal. So you need the man to be angry at the end of work so that the next day he go to work and kick over the thing and say, done. But that never happens. That never happens because when this man leaves work angry, he goes home to his woman, and his woman is there doing this whole heap of unpaid domestic labor, doing a lot of unpaid sexual labor, and doing a lot of physical abuse so that the man can be de-stressed. According to the Marxist feminist, when the men come home, they come home angry because of the exploitation at work. But from him reach home, his home is his castle. The woman makes sure, same yard, comfortable. Him have a nice chair where he can sit down, so he start de-stress same time. Him get the food where he like, so he can de-stress same time. He get sex from her if he so desires, him de-stress even more. Him not fully de-stress, him can lick her down. Total de-stress. And for that, and for that, the woman is not paid. And so because she performs all of this unpaid sexual labor and unpaid domestic labor, you find that the woman is being exploited. But ultimately, who benefits from it is capitalism. Because when she does all of this to de-stress the man, the man now goes back to work and work again for the bourgeois, work again for the capitalist, make only for profit for him, and the capitalist take all of the profit and give him a little bit called wages, and him come home again angry, and the anger does not lead to the revolution because the women, is, the women are there, sorry, protecting the capitalist system. Fran Ainsley says, women play their traditional roles as the takers of shaving cream. That is a term, a quote that is used in sociology all the time. Yeah, they play their traditional roles. They soak up the revolutionary anger of men. And in so doing, they protect capitalism. So the woman, by doing all of this unpaid domestic labor, all of this unpaid sexual labor, you find that she is protecting capitalism and for that she is not paid. And so she is being exploited. Good. Now they're criticized, but I'm going to wrap up their criticism with the radical feminists. Yeah, because remember there are three types of feminists. Radical feminists. Now what does the term radical mean? When you hear the term radical, radicals are extreme. The radical feminists say we live in a patriarchal society. And patriarchal, very important. You need to know that term is a key term. A patriarchal society is a male-dominated society. And so the radical feminists say we live in a patriarchal society where women are exploited by men for the benefit of men. The radical feminists are the burn the bra feminists, like we're done with man, we're tired of them, them just, they are take advantage of us. They say, nowhere is this exploitation more pronounced than when you go in the family. Them say, if you want to see how men take advantage of women going in the family, see who's in control. When you step in there, ask who control the remote, make a one TV. Ask who control the remote, the man. Him just come and say, football time and things have to change. Bam. Them say the food we're cooking at the house are the food where the man like. If the man don't like it, it can't cook. Yeah? I remember I was reading in the newspaper once where this artist, his name was Nature. He actually uh, was at, in court. He was arrested because him and him woman had fight and him beat her up. And when we asked what was the cause of the fight, it was that he was a raster and him woman had put pork in the fridge. 
And even me, when me I read it, I say, but the other woman here, yeah, but she out to order, how she for put pork in a Rastaman fridge, yeah? Because we're taking it for granted that a theme fridge, but she lived there too, and she like pork. She never cooked no pork, give me that. But because he's the man, if him no want a pork, no pork no fit in there. The radical feminists say that women work for men. They have no freedom at all. They say women have to support men. You ever go watch Man in Cup football yet? Look how much woman they there. Yes? The boy up on the bench. Your boyfriend up on the bench. Him now play, him can't play. Yeah? And still you and your five friends, them there, they make nice. Coach, play number four. Play number four. Him never get a play yet. And him still have three other girls that watch him too. Are you going to netball match? You see who they're there? Look how much man they there. One little boy. Another one where you don't really like, but him like you. The rest of boy them go about them business. Because you don't learn that women are to be supported like men. They say the majority of domestic labor is still done by women. And men, they say when a man gets married, his life gets better. When a woman gets married, his li her life gets worse. That's what the radical feminists say. As a consequence, the radical feminists say we must get rid of men and go live in all female communes. That's why they're radical. They say, go get rid of men, live in all female communes. When it's time for reproduction, you send for them. And then when they reproduce, send them back, go out in business, because they are exploit we. Now, the critics of the radical feminists say, listen, man. The radical feminists are biased and illogical. They say this thing with the radical feminists, are, it's crazy. First and foremost, they take it for granted that all women are good and all men are bad. But that is not necessarily the case. We have one for women. Jamaica is the jacket capital of the world. Come on. So it cannot be that all men are good or bad and all women are good. That's not the case. I saw the other day playing out on social media, there's this artist that his girlfriend gave him a, a jacket. And when it came out on social media, she made a video to explain why it was okay she could have given him a jacket. And when she made the video to explain the whole of the woman, them agree. Say, yeah, man, it's all right. Make him go. You know, take a jacket and go. It means that the radical feminists are being biased. Got to take it for granted that all men are bad and all women are good. Also, they said that women will go and live in all female communes. The critics said that that will never happen. It's illogical because women crave relationships more than men. Women are the ones that want marriages and relationships. From your reach 17, you get a little half boyfriend, you start practicing your signature. Your, your name and theme name. That's how you write it. Hmm? A you plan wedding, you know the dress where you go wear. From your reach certain age, you don't have nobody. You're 35, you have any little man, your mother say, come here, I have a daughter. Yeah? They say it is women who crave the relationships. And so this all-female communes, not going to work. The radical feminist theory, they say, is illogical. It is biased, just like the Marxist feminist as well. And so... We have looked at the interactionists today. We have looked at the feminists. You already did the functionalists and the Marxists. And so you have an understanding of the basic of, basis of sociology. And so that's a wrap on Class Time for today. <laughs>